where I fall. 10 more shall take my place and 100 each of them so strike me down I am the harbinger Elenius Pius, an imperial guardsman. The first guardsman to arch traitor Horus supercharged Mathefa King Avatar of Chaos Lupercal. Yes. You read that correctly. A hero is someone who steps up when everyone else backs down. Anonymous Elenius Pius embodies what it means to be a soldier of the Imperial Guard in this grimdark universe. He is the most hardcore guardsman ever and also the legendary saint of the Imperial Guard. Because as legend goes, in the hopes of protecting the Emperor of Mankind, Elenius Pius put himself directly in front of a walking demigod of battle. The fact that he did so without fainting, shitting himself in terror, or mewling like a wounded grok suggests that his testicles must have been forged from Mars grade adamantium, or more likely, he had power balls. His testicles were of such might that they ignored armor saves in close combat and could themselves be used as weapons. Alanius Pius is so manly that he makes Vance Mathefa King Stubbs, Commissar Yerick, Gregory Sonhorn, Syaphus Kane, Khan, Colonel Aaron Hans Strachan, Logan Grimner, Merrick, Harker, Creed and Sly Marbo piss themselves in terror. Well, maybe not Sly Marbo but he still respects the shit out of him. Naturally, like a bunch of awesome shit in virtually every piece of lore that has ever existed in Warhammer 40,000. Games Workshop Reds conned this story in several ways. Firstly his introduction is a bit of a retcon. Since Selenius wasn't in the original battle, read the Slaves to Darkness book, where the Emperor teleported to Horus Bunker not flagship, and fought him there. Then when he was introduced, he was said to have originally sacrificed himself during Horus' assault on the Imperial Palace, placing himself between the Emperor and Horus, which would mean in that version Horus broke through, which makes sense, so they had to change it. The next story the Emperor fought Horus in Horus' command bunker again, teleporting in with Imperial fists and custodes, and while having a bunker on the ground makes it entirely possible that Pius was there, especially since the traitor legions were busy at the palace walls, it's fairly unlikely. Then they changed it again, this time having Emps board Horus flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, along with a company of Imperial Fist Terminators and Custodes, no Pius this time due to the fact that a guardsman would probably die the second they arrive there. At no point from here on out is Elenius ever mentioned to have boarded the vengeful spirit. Though the idea of a heroic sacrifice was kept, GW replaced Pius with a Space Marine Terminator. Which wasn't that bad but then they retconned out the Terminator with an Adeptus Custodes, which is six kinds of lame. Fantasy Flight Games brought him back though, sort of leaving his existence in current canon questionable at best, which is a great justice and if you trust them, he really is just the most baddest guardsman ever, though exactly what he did isn't too clear besides die for the emperor. But, now, thanks to Dan Abnett, if GW ever returns Elenius to his place at the emperor's side, that's no big deal. He'll just be over 10,000 years old. Still a normal human but just one that regenerates and has lived a long time. So, following the trend, there is a risk that he will be added back in the universe as the one who made the chip in Horus' armor and not Sanguinius, and thus completely ruined the original story. Other than the fact that he was man enough to stand up to daddy's former favorite with nothing more than a flashlight and toilet paper armor, not much else is known about him, which probably means that he did even more heroic and manly shit during the Siege of Terror. The entire point of the character is to demonstrate that true courage and inner strength can be found even among the weakest. Games Workshop, in their infinite wisdom, completely missed this point and proceeded to replace the brave and ordinary little soldier with a progressively bigger and stronger superhero with every reveal retkin. Although, see below for a different take on his perpetuality and its implications in his final act of heroism. This, in a way, makes Horus fall to chaos seem less and less despicable. The original story of a superhuman so remorselessly killing an ordinary human could be seen in a similar light as a grown man killing a child. It is probably a near certainty that the next retkin will trade up the custode for one of the missing primarchs such as the glorious and magnificent Elenius Partridge, or a fucking omnipresent Imperial Knight. Further updates will likely add the Terminator, the Custode, the second missing Primarch and an Imperial Titan for good measure, 
all at the same time. However, in the visions of heresy novel, the humble imperial guardsman is back with his heroic act of sacrifice, though it is not stated whether his name was Elenius Pius. Probably because there was no need to since everyone already knew his name in the fandom. He also has a relic in the latest 6th edition Astra Militarum Imperial Guard Codex, with the fluff saying he martyred himself against Horus and is the epitome of Imperial Sainthood, as does a similar relic in the 8th edition Astra Militarum Codex. The Dark Heresy Blood of Martyrs Splat mentions him there, saying the story of Pius is apocryphal, bringing up that other organizations have their own version of the tale but still frequently told and he is widely venerated among guardsmen as an exemplar of what a faithful guardsman should be. So the Imperial Guard apparently canonically believes the original version of the tale, whether or not that's what actually happened. And at this point, nobody knows what actually happened and never will because G-Dubs refuses to enforce any kind of consistency in its own fluff. See below. New fluff also known as why the Black Library should not be allowed to write or sell anything. In Dan Abnett's Horus Heresy novel No No Fear Elanius Pius Law has changed dramatically. In the book he is named Elanius Pearson or all to his friends and is part of a small group of immortal humans spread throughout the galaxy called Perpetuals. John Grammaticus, who is alive and well, claimed that out of the entire Ultramarine Empire, which at the time consisted of a staggering 500 planets, there are only 3 perpetuals, the total amount in the Imperium is unknown, but almost certainly not much higher. Pius estimates his date of birth at some point around 15,000 BC, by contrast, the Emperor claims he was born in roughly 8000 BC which would make Pius no less than 7000 years older than the Emperor. It would also make him older than agriculture and is the same breed as Grammaticus and possibly the Emperor. At first this sounds like GW is missing the point again, but besides his extreme age and the whole immortality thing he seems to just be a normal human with normal human strength. Coupled with the fact that, by all indications, he hasn't died once so far. Which, when compared to the psychic gestalt Ubermensch that is the Emperor, is kind of important. Alanius is more representative of every strength and weakness of mankind than the Emperor ever was. In a follow-up in Mortis, John Grammaticus learns from watching a vision of Alanius Pius' memories while both were in a psychic illusion that he was actually the first war master and fought for the Emperor while tackling some cult building the Tower of Babel to harness the power of Inuncia. Basically Space Thursday um. While the cult was destroyed, he fell out with the Emperor over whether they should destroy the tower as they had originally planned or preserve it despite the dangers and the hopes of turning it against chaos, as the Emperor had decided to do instead. In the end, he stabbed the Emperor regretfully and then left after making the tower collapse. The Eternal Infantryman and the Days of Ancient Terror He was one of the Argonauts who adventured with Jason on the Argo to get the Golden Fleece and later he learned how to fight with a bayonet whilst fighting for the French in the trenches at Verdun during World War I. Note that Ole person is the obvious pun. It's an idiomatic French. Olivier person means Oliver Nobody, which has interesting implications in and of itself. Interestingly, Alania seems to be a sort of eternal soldier. He is also confirmed as having fought in the armies of Napoleon and Saddam Hussein, but always is depicted as being a part of the poor bloody infantry, in direct opposition to another perpetual, Big E himself, who is spoken of as having taken on the roles of various august and well-known historical personages or at least being close to positions of power throughout history. There is also an implication that Elanius always or at least usually fought on the losing side, which is also an interesting extension to this parallel. This makes him a sort of representative of the eternal ordinary everyman, and like almost every other perpetual, he doesn't have superpowers, except the neat trick of not dying, and lives ordinary lives, again and again. As the Emperor says to him in the exchange quoted above, this is more in line with the original spirit of the legend of Elanius Pius, and is a counter-argument to the more common view that he is becoming an Op Mary Sue instead of a representative of ordinary human strength and courage, the ultimate manifestation of which is seen in his actions aboard the vengeful spirit. We sometimes see glimpses of his soldiering past in Unmarked. 
Another Abner work, a short story in the anthology Mark of Kalth. He travels through time to various battles he fought in while evading the demon Prince Imkar in Angel Exterminators, where an iron warrior's trident warsmith Kroger has a flashback, sort of, the memories were the memories of other people, and relives the near death of Karl, a German soldier at the hands of one Olivier Pearson. Carl thought Ol was very rude because he interrupted Carl's dinner. Yes, poor Carl's dinner. All happened upon Carl eating. Full stop. Full stop. Carl's own commander. Oh yeah. Carl was a closet cannibal. Still, Carl thought it was a bit of an overreaction by an overly pious arsehole to stab Carl in the gut. Carl was only saved from a certain death when the crush of the battle forces Ol out of the trench. We don't get it either but a vision given to Elenius by Grammaticus indicates that he'll be be restored to his original status as the person who sacrifices his life to save the emperor from Horus, so at least he's back. Of course, whether he actually dies when this happens given the perpetual's ability to resurrect themselves upon death is anyone's guess. The confrontation with Horus might be true death for him, though, as an unmarked, he gets the distinct feeling that the current galactic clusterfuck is going to be the end for him. This might even make sense. Given that he was killed by not only a Primarch, but Horus supercharged by the energies of all four of the ruinous powers during an apocalyptic confrontation which outright killed another Primarch and put the most powerful being ever to emerge out of humanity in a near-death state. Get hit by what did that, you're probably not going to get up. And immortality won't help you if your soul is snuffed out by one of the most powerful material manifestations of chaos ever. If he did regenerate. He'd probably wake up on the vengeful spirit unless his body was moved perpetuals don't teleport when they die, they just heal and wake up. This might wind up being a far, far worse end than having his soul shredded. See over on the page for perpetual where we say that they've drawn the short straw here's an example of why. Needless to say, being trapped in the bowels of a chaos infested warship would not be good for him. Assuming he can even get off the bridge before Abby or one of his guards shoots him. Also in Unmarked, Alanius briefly hooks up with John Grammaticus, another perpetual, although far more of a dick. And, unlike all, apparently turned into a perpetual by the Cabal rather than being born one. You know, the guy who is actually with the Cabal. Going along with their Alpharius gambit to destroy humanity but wipe out chaos. But who is at some point persuaded by Elgrid Uthan to turn rogue against the Cabal. Since in a rare moment of non-dickery, Eldred decided that wiping out humanity might not be the best idea. Giving John the final push after long having some scruples about aiding in the genocide of his own race for, among others, arrogant space elves and a sentient floating ball of gas. Vulcan's permanent death does put a dent on perpetuals being unkillable. Artelis Numelon had to sacrifice himself to bring Vulcan back from that death. In the fury of Magnus, the titular Primarch himself uses his Chaos Sorcery Sicker powers to permanently kill Redacted which doesn't give Ollie a chance in hell he would survive the duel. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for Coom Jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Religion befitting his epithet. He is, indeed, a pious man. He is, in fact, a believing Catholic, which is apparently a bastardization of Catholic, exceedingly rare in the rapidly atheistic Imperium. Although not unique in the heresy era, another baddest guardsman Imperial Army Geno 5-2 Kiliad Hetman, Hurtado Bronzian Legion, also by Dan Abnett, 
identifies himself as Catheric by devotion. He even wears a cross around his neck which conceivably could get him into trouble. Practicing the major aspects his faith. Five of the seven sacraments require a priest. Would be difficult. As what happened to the Pope and Church hierarchy we don't know. Although it's probably pretty grimdark. According to real world Catholic belief. There is a biblical guarantee for an unbroken chain of popes and papal authority. Matthews v. 18. So there would be theoretically a pope somewhere. Or on the way. The church in Graham McNeil's the last church wasn't Catholic. Although it's sort of implied that it is a bastardized form of high church Christianity at least an ascetic which drifted in its beliefs over 30 millennia. Which isn't that surprising from the perspective of the sociology of religion. If it was really. However, the literal last church on terror, and the real world Catholic view is true. Somewhere in some corner of the Imperium there is a man who is the Pope and the church still exists. Picking up sticks and moving probably would have been wise anyway. Several sci-fi writers have speculated about this sort of thing. A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller. Considered a classic. Has the Catholic Church surviving several end-of-the-world techno-barbarian type scenarios preserving civilization and enduring over many millennia, eventually spreading beyond Earth? Despite the Emperor hating religion, Alanius was still doing the right thing by the tenets of his by then ancient faith explicitly says that soldiers should obey orders and people should respect their governments and leaders in general. CF. Roman Ziv. 3 FF. Referring to the emperor of the time. Sar change Bokudi chose. None. Except of course if it involved breaking the precepts of his religion. This was a real dilemma for Roman soldiers up until the 4th century or so. Because they had to worship the emperor. But this was not such a problem for Oli. He was a faithful imperial citizen and. While the imperium forbade religiosity. It did not. At the time of the Horus heresy which is when we last hear of him, require him to worship other gods or such, even though such beliefs were proscribed by the Imperium, which again resembles certain periods in church history. Despite the prohibition on religion, he seemed to live his faith reasonably openly and at best be regarded as a bit of an eccentric for it. Again, not all that different from certain eras of the Roman history in the 2nd and 3rd centuries it depended on who was on the imperial throne just how vigorously Christians were persecuted. Sometimes it was an all day buffet for lions and sometimes Christianity was looked at as at best a strange affectation certain people indulge in. Perhaps not entirely unlike we look at new religious movements today. In fact, ancient Rome very unlike the 30k imperium, would have had no problem with Christians at all if they didn't refuse to worship the emperor. You know, what Menachia got blast for. In the 40k imperium, the Ecclesiarchy would have probably been pretty cool with Christianity if the emperor was ultimately seen as God, which would make sanguineous Jesus except for the resurrection part which Christianity would not be cool with. So Alanius being Catheric would be a problem for him either way. And probably at several other points in his life. Maybe in the Iraqi army, for example. And one assumes at several points over the next 30,000 years or so, there is another fan theory that it refers to the Cathars, a heretical religious sect that the Iral Inquisition Iral Exterminate used in the 13th century. This is a clever play on words. But probably reads too much into it, but doesn't make any historical sense and doesn't really line up with the vague hints at Catharicism we get in the books. Saturnine. The redo. Alanius Pierce a new character introduced in one of the newest Horus Heresy books and the in-universe source of the legends about an Alanius Pius. Alanius Pierce was an Imperial Army soldier who fought in the Siege of Terror. He is the grandson of Alanius Pius, but goes by Oli. He's a follower of the Imperial cult and likes to tell exaggerated stories about himself. While under attack against forces of the World Eaters, Piers as well as a few other soldiers and a historian, Hari, went out of their way to raise up a banner of the Emperor before they were attacked by a World Eater Marine. Elenius managed to stand against the Marine long enough that a member of the Sisters of Silence whose powers made her invisible could kill the Marine. Afterwards, Piers encouraged the historian to replace the Marine with Horus and the banner with the emperor. Harry said that nobody would believe this story, 
and rejected most of the other changes Ollie requested. Ollie later died during the fall of the Eternity Wall, recreating part of the original Elenius Pyre story as he faces down Angren. Ollie reflects the traditional balls of steel approach by challenging fucking Angren to a fight, defending the banner of the Emperor, and firing into the demon Primatch until he is presumably rendered into a thin paste moments afterwards. Redefagatory warning. The following entry is so manly that reading it out loud may cause you to suddenly grow a beard. Girls. Do not read this out loud. A far TGUI's explanation of the original Alanius. Look at this fucking guardsman. He's spent months fighting a growling war in which his enemies are demigods allied with demons. And now he's found himself in the closest thing to hell he's ever known. He probably wasn't even supposed to get teleported up to the Arch Traitor's battle barge in the first place and just ended up in the wrong place at the worst possible time. Somehow he's survived horrors beyond comprehension to make his way to the very bridge of Horus' flagship. He saw a veritable angel call upon Horus to answer for his crimes, and he saw that angel die as messily as any guardsman. His emperor, who he fervently believes is a god incarnate, even if he's not supposed to, lies mortally wounded, and Horus, perhaps, has taken a moment to gloat before he strikes a killing blow. And yet there he is, standing, all alone, between the war master of everything humanity have ever fought against and the greatest being amongst all humanity, if even not godhood. His armor is slightly more effective than tissue paper, his weapon slightly more powerful than a flashlight. A single electrified claw from Horus' weapon is bigger than his entire body. He stands before a being infused by the dark gods with incalculable power. That cannon will obliterate his soul with no more effort than it would take him to swat a gnat. Nothing he can do could possibly make a difference. He could run. He could turn his weapon on himself. He could give in to the insidious whispers that echo from the ship's corridors into his mind. Elenius Pius does the duty his emperor requires of him. He dies standing and holds the fucking line. A short poem about Elenius Pius the first time I hold my blood in my hands. The first time I see a man with nothing would be the first time I see my own lands covered in heresy, death, and rotting. My son stands over him corrupt and pale. A god Alanius Pius stands free. My fallen Horus lifts the deadly flail. In one instant, the strength of man I see. This mere man done what I was unable. A tear flows from my eye and it is clear. The tyrant's cold reign I must disable. Briefly I know what it means to feel fair. I leave the future to the strength of man. For they alone do far more than I can. Another poem regarding Elenius somewhere in the universe a coin flip lands on its side. Somewhere in the universe a drop of water saves a life. Somewhere in the universe a pebble stops a landslide. Maybe it is because someone believed hard enough. Maybe it is because everything is secretly fair. Maybe it is because the universe is a vast place. Yesterday, I was very cold. Yesterday, I was very hungry. Yesterday, I wanted to run away. Today, I am going to believe hard enough. Today, a pebble will stop a landslide. Today, I am not going anywhere.